Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 35. To Rome, to Rome. Today we will look at what went on with Gregory VII after Henry had left to fight his rivals in Germany. Spoiler alert, things will not turn out the way the Pope had hoped. Before we start, just a reminder. The History of the Germans is advertising free thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com. you find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Alon and Banked who have already signed up. Okay, back to the show. When Henry IV left Pope Gregory in Canossa in January 1078, Gregory thought he had won the ultimate victory, and Henry would from now on be an obedient son of the church. And that should give him room to look after his other ambitions, namely to bring the King of France to heel and to cash in on support he had given to William the Conqueror, you know, the guy who invaded England whilst Henry was fighting to establish his personal rule in 1066. Let's start with the Conqueror. Gregory had ensured that William had the full support of the papacy and even received a papal banner to be carried into battle. His objective was to gain control over the English church. And William, it seemed, delivered, at least initially. He removed the existing Anglo-Saxon bishops wholesale and replaced them with reform-minded Norman clergymen. His new Archbishop of Canterbury, Lanfranc, was a man of international standing, originally from Italy. And though Lanfranc did all the right things and collected his pallium in person in Rome and swore to be obedient to the Pope, relations soured. When it came to Gregory's claim to be the overlord of all secular rulers, Lanfranc was not falling in line. His allegiance was first and foremost to the man who put him in his post, William the Conqueror. He sided with his lord when Gregory insisted on the appointment of the Bishop of Dole, and even more importantly, when Gregory insisted on splitting the country between the archbishops of York and Canterbury. Gregory wrote a string of angry letters to William and Lanfranc, but England, being a country far, far away, and his ruler well established, all he could do is write and be angry. Geography matters, like, a lot. And on that score, France looked like an easier place to assert papal authority. Gregory had good reason to castigate the King of France for the way he selected his bishops. In the second half of the 11th century, the kings of France were, by all accounts, the poor relations of the European rulers. Their land barely extended beyond the Ile de France. One of the few sources of income to the king was the right to invest his bishops, and he charged handsomely for that. Gregory's letters were a lot more effective in France than they were in England, as the powerful magnate used it to further constrain the power of the king. And it was mostly with an eye to France rather than Germany that Gregory VII declared in 1080, quote, Following the statutes of the Holy Fathers, now we decree and confirm that if any one henceforth shall receive a bishopric or abbey from the hands of any lay person, he shall by no means be considered as among the number of the bishops and abbots, nor shall any hearing be granted him as bishop or abbot. Moreover, do we deny him the favor of St. Peter and the entry to the church until, coming to his senses, he shall desert the place he is taken by the crime of ambition as well as by that of disobedience. Likewise, if any emperor, king, duke, markgraf, count, or any one at all of the secular powers or persons shall presume to perform the investiture with bishoprics or any ecclesiastical dignity, he shall be bound by the bonds of that same condemnation. Unquote. This is the famous ban on lay investiture. And what it says is quite simple. If any bishop, abbot, or priest has been put into his role by a layman, he is automatically excommunicated, and so is the layman who had put him there. There were bans on lay investiture before, but they were rarely as clear and as uncompromising as this. The real investiture conflict starts here in 1080. Sure, the struggle between Gregory and Henry had its beginnings in the conflict over the investiture of the Bishop of Milan, but the heart of the conflict had not been over the investiture of bishops, but over whether the Pope ranks above the Emperor. This ban turns it from a struggle for supremacy into a fight over the institutional integrity of the empire. 
An emperor who cannot appoint his bishops means that the imperial church system collapses, and without the bishops, the emperor has no soldiers. And that does not just apply to the empire. As we saw some episodes ago, the power of the Norman dukes and later the kings of England was as well dependent on their control over the bishops. The conflict had become a fundamental question over the respective responsibilities of the ecclesia, the church, and the mundus, the world. Initially, the ban on investiture, as well as the second excommunication of Henry IV, went nowhere. Gregory's excommunications have been raining down on people in such frequency that they had stopped caring. Practically all Lombard bishops had been excommunicated for years already. Many of Henry's supporters in Germany are now excommunicated for the second time, and now the King of France and even the King of England were on the verge of being banned. But it wasn't just the die-hard supporters of Gregory's direct adversaries that were banned, but neutral bishops were required to come to Rome and receive the pallium, or were refused consecration. And their reform efforts were criticized and constant demands to do this or that were issued. And if one takes the wording of the ban on lay investiture literally, more or less everybody was excommunicated, because pretty much every bishop, abbot and priest had received at least his worldly fiefs from a secular lord. And these secular lords were now also technically under the ban. As I say, if everybody is excommunicated, nobody is. Never will a ruler kneel in the snow before the Pope again. Greatest weapon of the papacy be utterly spent in just three years. Henry's reaction to this synod in 1080 was to hold his own synod in Brixen. Having first gathered his support amongst his bishops in Germany, he brought the Italian and German support together, a total of 30 senior clergy. This synod did something the Synod of Worms in 1077 did not dare to do. It canonically deposed and expelled Gregory and condemned him in perpetuity if, having heard this decree, he does not step down. This synod accused Gregory of various misdeeds, including simony, violence, false oaths, the support of heresy, murder, pornographic floor shows, and even of having a demon, all based on testimony of Hugh the White, Cardinal Bishop of San Clemente and sworn enemy of Gregory VII. So far, so traditional. These kinds of arguments have been made as far back as the deposition of John XII by Otto the Great, who was accused of Congress with all sorts of occult spectres. But as time went on, the arguments for the deposition of Gregory changed in quality. It is right around this time that Roman law, specifically the Justinian Code, was being studied again for the first time in centuries. Until now, most secular law had been Germanic law codes, which had very limited internal coherence, and some argue have actually rarely been applied. Royal judgments tended to be a bit ad hoc and often political. The church had raced ahead and canon law had gained a lot of internal coherence during the 11th century. By the time of Gregory, most bishops would have a collection of canon law in their possession and would base their decisions who to support in the ongoing conflict on these laws. There are conflicting sources who order the codification of canon law and who actually produced the first approved version but by the end of the century, canon law had a solid structure and coherence. Now, if the church has a Korean system of law, the secular lords needed one too. And that law was Roman law, compiled during the reign of the Emperor Justinian in the early 6th century. If in canon law, the Pope was the source of all justice and truth, under the Justinian Code, that role fell to the Emperor. Secular rulers really fell in love with the Justinian Code once they could interpret it such a way that Emperor does not mean Henry IV, but any King, Prince, Count or Baron. One of the key provisions of the Justinian Code was the Les Majesté, disrespecting the crown, a crime punishable by death. And that is what Gregory was accused of. He had offended the dignity of the ruler by claiming his excommunication. For now, these arguments did not yet carry much weight, nor did other legal constructs from the Justinian Code used in the case of Henry IV. But as we will see, the Roman law and its notions of the role of kings will become a key justification for the expansion of royal power, culminating in absolute monarchies almost anywhere in Europe, except for some outliers like Britain, Poland and Venice. 
The split of law into church law and secular law is rare outside Europe and is just another result of the events we describe here and call the investiture conflict or just Canossa. The Synod of Brixen did not just depose Gregory. It also elected Wiebold, Archbishop of Ravenna, as successor to Gregory VII. Wiebold was of the same age as Gregory, but different in background. Wiebold was an old-school prelate in the mould of Leo IX. Of aristocratic stock, he had pursued his career in the wind shadow of the Emperor Henry III and had risen to Imperial Chancellor for Italy. Empress Agnes made him the Archbishop of Ravenna, and despite his initial support for the antipope Catullus, was given the pallium by Pope Alexander II. Gregory and Wiebert initially got on quite well, but at some point Gregory thought him insufficiently fervent in his support for reform and excommunicated him. Just another one. Wiebert took the name of Clement III, but declared that he would not act as Pope until he had been properly enthroned on the seat of St. Peter. That might have been Clement's own choice or a move by Henry IV to leave a way open for reconciliation with Gregory. What is clear is that for the policy to work, Henry will have to bring Clement down to Rome, remove Gregory and effect a proper coronation of the Pope. To get that done proved time-consuming. By 1081 Henry had suppressed the rebellion in Germany sufficiently to mount an attack on Italy, and so he took a small army across the Alps. The Lombard bishop swelled the ranks of his army and the journey down south ran smoothly. Henry was thinking that he would be back in Germany within a mere four months. Gregory's position looked very fragile. Gregory had not only lost a lot of ground with the church, he had excommunicated Robert Giscard, the Norman lord the church had been relying on for the last decade. Gregory and Robert did patch up things in 1080, but the Norman was anything but an obedient vassal. Robert's main focus was Constantinople, which had fallen into complete disarray after the terrible defeat against the Seljuk Turks at Manzikart. Robert, freebooter to the last, instead of defending Christendom against the Muslim onslaught, thought of benefiting from the chaos and pick up as much of the Byzantine Empire as possible. So, not much help to be expected from this side. Matilda, Countess of Tuscany, was forever loyal, but powerful as she may be, could she hold out against the combined forces of the Empire and the Lombard bishops? The last part of Henry's calculation was that the population of Rome should be on his side. A former prefect had already tried to abduct Gregory in 1075 and he now assured the king of the support he should encounter in the city. Henry arrived in Rome at Pentecost expecting to be greeted by a procession of the Senate and people of Rome accompanying him into the city under the singing of hymns and prayers. He was sorely disappointed. Instead of candles, they met the king with spears. Instead of singing clergy, with armed warriors. Instead of anthems of praise, with reproaches. Instead of applause, with sobs. You should always remember that the church reform movement was first and foremost a movement of the people. And that is why they supported Pope Gregory as a representative of reform versus the conservative backlash. Rome's defences, built by the Emperor Aurelian in the 3rd century, were still strong and well maintained. And Gregory had created the papal militia as his own military force that now manned the fortifications. Henry's supporters had come dressed for a party, not for war. They had no siege equipment and their army was small. But most importantly, it is already Pentecost, i.e. early May, and Rome's greatest defence mechanism, malaria, is getting into gear. There's nothing Henry can do but retreat with his tail between his legs. This is the first time an imperial progress towards a coronation had failed. The embarrassment of the failed coronation was almost as detrimental to his standing as the kneeling in the snow of Canossa. As things stood, Henry now needed to get crowned, cost it what it may. If he did go back to Germany without a crown, his enemies would feel vindicated, and the wavering middle would believe that God had made it clear that Henry should not be king. The next two years, Henry roamed around Italy, fighting Matilda of Tuscany and gathering armies he brought before Rome to besiege the city. His army initially consisted mostly of the contingents of the Lombard bishops, but over time he gathered more supporters. Amongst them were the Tuscan cities of Lucca and Pisa. 
Lucca had been the preeminent city of Matilda's lands. Lucca was most famous for its silk weavers, who initially imported their raw materials from the Near East via Genoa before producing it themselves. Lucca was also home to prominent members of the Carlonimus family, which must count as one of the most creatively productive families in history. They can trace their lineage back to the 8th century, and a string of rabbis, preachers, poets, teachers, authors, moralists and theologians, and many prominent leaders of Jewish communities in Italy and Germany up to the 15th century came from its ranks. They had been invited to settle in Germany by Charlemagne or one of his successors, and they played a major role of the great Jewish communities of Speyer and Mainz, as well as in Lucca. Sorry, I digress. Back to Lucca. Henry IV offered the city more or less total freedom from oversight by either the Margrave of Tuscany or the Emperor himself. The city was allowed to build and maintain its own defences, was no longer obliged to build or maintain the Imperial Pfalz, could no longer be billeted with soldiers, received market rights, customs privileges and jurisdiction over everything but the most severe crimes. Lucca became thereby the first city in the Empire to be officially granted the full rights of an Imperial Free City. But Lucca was by no means the first free city in Italy. Seafaring places like Venice, Genoa, Pisa, Amalfi and Naples had been de facto free cities for a long time already. But even these saw value in being granted rights and privileges by the Empire. Pisa valued the confirmation of its rights sufficiently to side with Henry IV. Whilst Henry was gathering troops in Italy, the situation in Germany oscillated. At times, the new anti-king Hermann managed to gain control of Saxony and the bits of Swabia, and even at some point contemplated a march on Rome to support the Pope. But that effort collapsed when Otto von Nordheim finally died, and Hermann had to focus on holding Saxony. For Henry, that meant he had to rush back and forth between Rome, the lands of Matilda of Tuscany and the Alpine passes, never able to fully deploy his forces for a lengthy siege. He showed up in Rome in February of 1082 with an army, but that siege failed again at the staunch defence of the Roman population. Despite Henry's efforts going nowhere, Gregory's position also became desperate. He was simply running out of funds. He had called a synod for Lent in Rome, but hardly any bishops made it through. And when Gregory asked for approval to pawn the church property to fund the ongoing war, the few bishops who had gathered refused. Matilda herself under enormous pressure, had the great gold crosses and liturgical objects held at Canossa melted down and sent to the Pope as bullion. By 1083, Henry found a new ally, Jordan of Aversa, the other Norman. You may remember that Pope Nicholas II had elevated two Norman warlords to become dukes, Robert Giscard and Reinulf of Aversa. The idea was to split the Norman power in the south to ensure the papacy does not get too dependent on just one ruler. Robert Giscard was a lot more successful than his countrymen, but the Aversa Normans were still around. These now joined Henry's side in an attempt to push back Robert Giscard. Giscard himself was at the time fighting in Greece and what is now Albania, having upgraded his ambition from just taking over chunks of the Byzantine Empire to making the whole lot a Norman kingdom. In the year 1083, Henry showed up before the gates of Rome again. As before, he set up camp on the Vatican side of the Tiber. His troops made two attempts to overrun the Leonine walls that protected St. Peter, but were rebuffed. On the third attack, the Romans attempted a sortie to break the siege. Fighting ferociously, driven by the pangs of hunger and desperation, they pushed Henry's forces all the way back into their camp. Henry Seeing that his rule may come to an end in this skirmish, joined the fray and his soldiers followed him with renewed vigour, driving the Romans back behind the walls of the city. This fight had broken the resilience of the Romans, who found themselves bereft of food, supplies and any hope of relief. Matilda was unable to help, the Normans were overseas, morale deteriorated and discipline became slack. A few days later, Henry's soldiers noticed that a stretcher wall had no guards on them. In the dark, they brought the ladders and climbed in without encountering any resistance. They opened the gates and the imperial soldiers flooded in. Gregory and his closest associates rushed to the safety of the Castello di Sant'Angelo, 
whilst resistance on the Vatican side of the city quickly overcame. The papal militia was however able to hold the bridge over the Tiber and the main city of Rome remained in Gregory's hands. And after that, negotiations started again. From Henry's perspective, the best solution would be if Gregory could be made to crown him. That would remove the stain of excommunication and end the conflict. Hence he and his Pope-elect Wiebert left Rome. He kept the garrison there and tore down the walls of the Vatican City. Things looked good for a while as Gregory, pressured by the Roman people, called a synod and promised to subject himself to whatever the synod decides about how the conflict should be resolved. How sincere this promise was soon became clear. His invitation to the synod included clear instructions to the bishops attending. They were told to defend the church against the king, a king he had once again excommunicated from the walls of the Castello di Sant'Angelo. Gregory really did not care for compromise. Henry had no option than to sabotage the synod by apprehending the Gregorian bishops travelling to Rome. In the meantime, he had received some financial support from the emperor in Constantinople, who had come under sufficient pressure from Robert Giscard. The Byzantine emperor wanted Henry to invade Giscard's lands in the southern Italy, and thereby forcing him to abandon his attacks against the Eastern Empire. Henry used these funds to bribe the Romans, who were now seriously tired of the stubborn Holy Father. They may support church reform, but they were even more keen on bringing these pointless sieges to an end. And even in his College of Cardinals, dissent was rising. His autocratic style had already irritated some of these eminent churchmen, but his insistence on fighting to the death was the last straw. In 1084, 16 cardinals went over to Henry's camp, and finally Rome opened its doors. Henry and the Archbishop of Ravenna moved into the Palace of the Lateran. A synod was called, which deposed and excommunicated Gregory VII again. Wiebert was elected as Pope Clement III again, and consecrated by the Cardinal Bishop of Ostia, as was right and proper. And then, Finally, finally, Henry IV, King of the Romans since 1056, was crowned Emperor in St. Peter in the 28th year of his reign, by Pope Clement and in the presence of many bishops, cardinals, dukes, counts and the Roman people. If it wasn't for the previous Pope still holding out in the Castello di Sant'Angelo, it would have appeared as if finally the good years of Emperor Henry III were back. Are they? Well... We will see next week. Gregory is still around. There's Robert Giscard, whose adventure in Byzantium is going pear-shaped. When he returns to defend his lands, now under threat from Henry in Rome, the roller coaster that is Henry IV's reign will take another turn, a turn the brunt of which will be borne not by Henry, but by the people of Rome, who will see their worst fears realized. I hope you will join us again next week. And in the meantime, should you feel like supporting the show and get hold of these bonus episodes, sign up on Patreon. The links are in the show notes and on my website at historyofthegermans.com.